Okay, let's start. Hello from uh, Potsdam. Uh, thank you for joining us for this week's uh, ENLA seminar. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gunnar Martinson this week. Uh, he will join us from Texas. Um, he's, uh, he did his undergraduate at the University of Kalmus University in uh, Stockholm and his PhD in Texas, and then went through several places, uh, Yale University, Colorado, um, and had a short stay at the University of Oxford recently as well, and is now uh, a, chair, a chair at the University of Texas at Austin. He's very uh, well known for his work on randomized algorithms uh, for low rank uh, approximations of matrices. And I really recommend, if you haven't done so yet, uh, recommend you to read the paper, uh, the SIAM review paper on finding structures with randomness, probabilistic algorithms for constructing approximate matrix uh, decompositions uh, with his core of Stroll Trop and uh, Nathan Halko. Um, so it's my pleasure, uh, it's our pleasure that he's actually here to talk about randomized algorithms for pivoting and for computing interpolatory and pure factorization. And before I hand over, uh, let me uh, tell you how um, you can ask questions. So as usual, you can ask uh, questions in the chat. The chat will be monitored by Bart van der Eiken this week, uh, who will then uh, let you read out unmute you and let you read out the questions and the questions on YouTube will be monitored by uh, Daniel Krasner. So thank you, Gunnar, uh, and you have the microphone. Thank you very much. Many thanks for the very kind introduction and in particular, thanks for the invitation. This is a great opportunity and doing such a service to, uh, to run this seminar. I've learned a lot this past year. So it's, it's great to now be on the other side of the screen. Um, so on this title slide, there's two things I want to highlight. So one is that a lot of this work, my student Ji Jin Jong has really been uh, extremely helpful in the key parts of the work. And the other important part is that the slides are posted on my webpage. So if somebody wants to go there and download them and follow along, then that should be possible. So it's... Uh, the outline is short, there are only two points. The first one will probably take quite a while. And then the second one will go a little bit faster because the second one is really derivative from the first that a lot of the ideas and the techniques that we introduce initially. So initially we'll talk about basically the problem of picking a handful of columns from a very large matrix such that those columns form a good approximate basis for the column space. And that turns out to be a technique that's very useful later on in finding ways to block algorithms for computing a column pivoted QR factorization of a large matrix. So we start with low rank approximation in point one, and then we'll talk about how to compute full factorizations in point two. And I'm guessing in this audience, most people are familiar at this point with the CUR or skeleton approximations or the term interpolatory decomposition is often used. But uh, let's quickly go over these since they are certainly far less commonly used than say the standbys LU and QR and so on. But, uh, but these are also very interesting in their own right. So the idea is that given a matrix A, so you have a matrix A of this shape, you want to factorize it. So this is gonna be a low rank factorization where the factors are thin in at least one direction and U is the small center matrix. And what's the, the characteristic feature of the CUR decomposition is that the, the big factors C and R, they are sub matrices of A. So C consists of a subset of K columns and R consists of a subset of R rows, of K rows. So the trick is how to find those. How do you find the subset of columns that form a good basis for the column space and then the subset of rows? that form a good basis for the row space. And there are several variations of this theme. So you have these interpolatory decompositions that are also skinny in this sense, but uh, you can do it one-sided. You can use just the columns to span the column space. You can ju use just the rows to span the row space, or you sometimes use this interpolatory decomposition where you sort of flip things around and it's the core matrix in the middle that's a, um, a sub matrix of the original one. Okay, so why would you want to do these things? So there are several reasons. So one is that these factorizations, they preserve 
essential properties of the matrix. So if A is sparse, then the factors R and C are sparse as well. And these are the long factors. So if you have a lot of sparsity, then that clearly is very economical. So this is in contrast to say, if you do a singular value decomposition or an LU decomposition or something, in which case the factors tend to be fully dense or at least more dense than A is. Uh, Non-negativity is another property that is oftentimes nice to preserve in a factorization. Uh, you can sometimes use this for uh, data interpretation. If you have a, a data matrix where each column represents something, say you're tracking values of the stock on the stock market or something, you want to pick some particular stocks that are indicative. This has been used for genetics. You want to pick out some specific genes that sort of carry a lot of meaning that have explanatory power for the entire matrix. There are storage advantages to these factorizations because sometimes you don't need to actually compute these factors C and R. If you have the matrix A available already or you can cheaply compute it, then as long as you store the indices, right, you don't need to store the actual factors. So it's very nice. And uh, it also comes in a lot in solvers for elliptic PDs, which is really how I got into these things, but that's something we're not going to touch on in this talk. Okay, so the existence of these factorizations is, is a completely elementary fact. It follows immediately from the fact that the matrix has low rank or approximate low rank. So in order to describe this, let us start with the, the simplest case in which we assume that the matrix has exact rank K. Then what we do is that we split it into four blocks so that the top left block here is a K by K submatrix. And we want that block to be non-singular. So that's why I may need to rotate. I may need to permute the rows and the columns. And to give you a little bit of a preview, like the main problem that we're gonna address at least in the next 20 minutes is how do you pick these vectors I and J to make things work nicely. But uh, once you have them, then everything else is very straightforward. So if we think of the matrix as being a two by two block matrix like this, then you can easily prove, this is just from the definition of low rank, that the bottom left block, so in general, so think of this factorization as, you know, the top left block is small and the guy down here is very large, but it can be represented in terms of the other three factors. So once you've convinced yourself that this relationship holds, then all these factorizations follow immediately. So you can write A, for instance, as a CUR decomposition like this, where you just pull out the A11 inverse in the middle and that becomes your U factor. Or you can leave, you can pull in A11 into the middle like this, and then that's your interpolatory factorization. So, so basically, it's the existence of these factorizations is it's a completely elementary fact. But there are two questions that are slightly perhaps deeper. And one is, are these factorizations well conditioned? Can you form, can you find a set of k columns that form a, a good basis in some sense? Or is this going to be a terrible basis? The fact that they do form a basis, I mean, this is, again, if you have a matrix of rank k, then obviously, straight by the definition, there must exist k columns that form a basis for the column space, but are they a well-conditioned basis? That is perhaps a slightly more interesting question. And then the even more interesting question is, if you have a matrix that's only of approximate rank, then if you look for a factorization with this very special structure, then how close do you get in terms of approximability? How well do you do in approximating the matrix? So let us address these two questions, just a very quick overview of what's known. So we'll start with talking about the conditioning of the interpolatory decomposition. So the interpolatory decomposition looks like this. Remember, the matrix. Oh. Weird, my pencil started, stopped working. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So you have something like this. And the middle matrix there is the uh, sub matrix of A. Now, if you recall, 
in a factorization of this type, we want X and Z to hold K by K identity matrices as submatrix. You see that's here and here. And that of course means that the smallest singular values of X and C are necessarily gonna be one. So in order to have a well-conditioned basis, what you want is that the largest singular value has to be controlled in some sense. And the best you can do in the general case is to show that all there exists a permutation i and j such that all the elements of x and c are individually bounded by one in uh, modulus. And this is really a straightforward application of Kramer's rule. You can show that if you pick these permutations right, then you can control all entries of those guys, which are the blocks that are outside of the identity matrix in X and C. And uh, this means that you, they are reasonably well conditioned. I mean, these are certainly not orthogonal bases. They are not the, the columns of X and the rows of C. They're not orthonormal bases for the row and column spaces, but they're decent bases. So their condition numbers look something like this. It depends a little bit on which norm you use and so on, of course. But the short answer is yes, that uh, you can find well-conditioned basis and proving so is not particularly hard. Actually finding these computationally it turns out to be substantially more challenging. The CUR decomposition is a little bit different and it is typically not well-conditioned. And the reason for that, if we go back, is that in the CUR decomposition, we have basically A11 inverse in the middle and if you have a good factorization of this type, then the singular values of A11 should in some sense sort of follow the top K singular values of A. And in almost all applications where you do low rank approximation, you have decay in the singular values, right? So uh, the K singular value of A11 is typically quite small. So A11 inverse is inherently going to be an ill-conditioned. It, there's gonna be very large entries in there. So if you care about conditioning, then the interpolatory decomposition is generally preferable. All right, so next let's uh, quickly recap what we know about optimality in terms of low rank approximation. And our reference point here is of course the Eckhart-Jung theorem that says that the best possible rank K approximation when you use uh, spectral norm or Frobenius norm is uh, the singular value decomposition. That if you compute the singular value decomposition and you take the top K modes, then that provides your best rank K approximation. And when you use the spectral norm, which is typically what we'll do in this talk, then the approximation error is the K plus one singular value of A. So the question then is if you pick the best possible ID or CUR decomposition, then how close do you get how well can you approximate A? And typically, so there's always some factor of suboptimality. So you don't get, uh, you don't do as well as the SVD in the worst case. There's typically some factor of suboptimality that looks something like root KN or something like this. So for instance, I quoted this theorem that is due to Chertushnikov and coworkers that shows a fairly sharp result on how well you can do in the worst case. In many cases, you can do much better. So in particular, if the singular values of A decay rapidly, then typically there's very little difference between the best possible rank K approximation and the best possible interpolatory or CUR decomposition. Um, so there's a, a survey of Daniel Kressner that describes these things very nicely. All right. So now let's turn to what's really the focus of this talk, which are efficient algorithms for doing these things. So how do you efficiently pick the columns? How do you, and I'll focus on, of course we can talk about rows or columns doing them together, but to keep things simple, let's focus on just the problem of picking columns. If you can solve this problem, then everything else follows pretty straightforwardly. So we'll talk about, so our, Computational primitive is this column selection problem. I want to find basically a, an index vector that identifies the K columns that I want. And then I also want what I call an interpolation matrix. So it's uh, 
this is a matrix so C is a it has k rows and it has k, k, a k by k identity matrix as a submatrix. So my task is given A, I want to compute J, S, and C. And there is a solution to this problem that is much older than the field of numerical linear algebra. And it's simply to do Gram-Schmidt on the columns. Just grab the largest column of A, or normalize it, and that's your first basis vector, then orthogonalize all the remaining columns with respect to the first, pick the largest one that survives and so on. And of course, the way we in numerical linear algebra tend to think about this is as a QR factorization. So if you do K steps of this process, and here I'm not, I'm not gonna carefully differentiate by exactly how you do this. Do you do classical Gram-Schmidt, modified household or givens? You know, there are many ways of doing it, but for purposes of column selection, Let's postpone the discussion of which one is better. But so basically you get a low rank approximation of A that's now in the form of Q and R factors. But of course, by just doing a very slight amount of reshuffling of this factorization, I pull R11 out of the R factor to form Q R11. So this is my factor C and then this guy becomes my factor Z, All right? So that is the, the column ID, basically. Now I've solved the column selection problem. So very simple algorithm, it works wonderfully well. One thing you have to keep in mind is that if you code this up, it's extremely important that you maintain orthonormality. If you use, Certainly everybody knows that classical Gram-Schmidt tends to not work well, but even modified Gram-Schmidt tends to numerically fail in that you get really large entries here. So it's, it's really crucial to maintain orthonormality. So use household reflectors, or you can do double Gram-Schmidt to both classical and modified, that also works well. And, but if you do that, then Column pivot of Gram-Schmidt is a wonderful algorithm. It's, it's really solved this problem very well as long as the matrix is moderately sized. It can in principle fail. There are these counter examples. They're very, very rare in practice. This scheme, it's reasonably computationally efficient as long as the matrix fits in RAM. We're gonna talk about accelerations later. And uh, from a theoretical point of view, there are these very sophisticated column selection mechanisms that are guaranteed to give you reasonably close to optimal um, selections. And this is very nice work. All right, but some questions still remain. So what do you do if the matrix is very large? Say you have a data matrix that's of size 100,000 by 100,000 and it's stored on a hard drive you really can't do this column pivoting stuff because at each step you need to update the entire matrix. And maybe you can postpone things a little bit and improve things around the edges, but it, it, it's a really challenging thing. But what if the matrix is of size a million by million or a billion by billion, but sparse, then certainly column pivoted QR is not gonna do it for you. And so those are the important points. And then sort of as a fun point for those of us who really like numerical linear algebra, you can actually use this to accelerate column pivoted QR itself. So even if you have a matrix of size, say 5,000 by 5,000, and you could perfectly well do 50 steps of column pivoted QR, there are ways of making that computation run much faster and we can actually even beat the complexity of the scheme in terms of asymptotic flop count. So let's see how this works. So the key idea is to create what we call a sketch of the matrix and I'll make that term precise shortly. So here's a little theorem and it's almost silly to call this statement here a theorem because it's again, it's, it's a trivial fact. It's the, the proof is literally just combining these two assumptions. But, uh, but the assumptions are the following. So the first one is that we have some low rank factorization of A. So A here is assumed to be a matrix of exact rank. So this is you know a slightly artificial Starting example, we'll solve this, and then we'll talk about the interesting case of approximate rank. But in the case we have exact rank, suppose you have any factorization of A. And then this factor A, so think of A as being large and F as being 
a small matrix. Then in the second assumption, we assume that we can process this small matrix F and we can pick columns from that guy. So for instance, do column pivot a QR on the columns of F. It's very small, so you know, it, there's hope that this guy is gonna fit. Maybe it fits in cache if the matrix is small or if A is very large, then at least F should fit in RAM or something like this. So if we can do this, then you're done. You're automatically done. And uh, because the point, the columns you pick for F are automatic, they automatically work for A as well. And maybe this is obvious to everyone because you know, the proof is, as I said, it's literally just taking the two assumptions and plugging one into another. So uh, I'm almost embarrassed to call this a theorem. It's, it's very simple. But the first time I saw it, it's, it was something that I had not thought about. So it was sort of an interesting thought, nevertheless. All right, so now the question is, how do we find this matrix F? So F is what I refer to as the sketch. So what, what are the properties we need of F? So for F, the property that I need is that the rows of F need to span the row space of A. That's really the only property. As long as they do, then necessarily the matrix E must exist. So how do we do this in a computationally efficient manner? And this is where the randomization come in. So we're already at 922 and uh, so far I have not mentioned randomization, but this is where it comes in. So it turns out that a very efficient way of doing this is to draw a thin matrix omega. Um, it has just K rows and in each entry of omega, I draw a, a, a random number from a standardized normal distribution. So I get this matrix omega that uh, has only k rows, so I multiply it by a, and then I get the matrix F. So F here is the matrix that's thin in that direction. And now every row of F is a random linear combination of the rows of A. And you can prove that with probability one, the k rows of F form a basis for the row space of A, of F, yeah, of A. Uh, they're obviously inside the row space, but the fact that they are linearly independent, perhaps, you know, there, there's something interesting to be said to, there's something that's interesting about that fact. Because in principle, it could be the case that, say, one of the rows of omega it could, in principle, be orthogonal to the column space of A, but uh, you can easily prove that the likelihood of that happening is, is, is exactly zero when you draw omega from the Gaussian distribution. All right, so the important point here is that we never need the matrix E. It, it never, you never need to form it. You just need to form F and you do the, you solve the column selection problem by looking only at F. And uh, there you go. So here is uh, the basic algorithm. And of course, what we're gonna talk about next is what happens when A doesn't have exact rank K because that's an artificial situation. But uh, before we start to talk about practical aspects of how to do this, let's just summarize the algorithm. So here I exactly just summarized the key points from the last slide. We're given a matrix A, we want to compute, we want to find the index vector that identifies the columns and the interpolation matrix C. And what we do is we form the random matrix omega, we form the sample matrix F, and then we solve the column selection problem for the small matrix F. There is an oversampling parameter here. So we draw a few extra rows. This is for both for numerical stability and for computational accuracy. It improves the accuracy of the scheme a little bit. In practice, you can actually skip that. It, it works fine even if you don't do the oversampling, but it costs very little and it's helpful. So maybe I should stop and see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, I don't see any questions for the moment. Okay, great. So, um, or I shouldn't say great, I very much welcome questions. There will be, this part of the talk will last for another 10 minutes say, and I can take a slightly 
I'll do another question call at that point. All right, so, so far in the basic scheme, we assume A to be a random matrix that drawn from a normal distribution. So we call these a uh, Gaussian random matrix. And this is, uh, it's a very popular way of doing it. It's fairly close to optimal in a theoretical sense because they sample space completely evenly. No direction is favored, which is sort of what you need for optimality. And uh, the scheme is very computationally efficient because most of the flops you spend in just a matrix matrix multiply, which is very fast in most, most computational environments. You can in particular do this very fast when A is sparse. Of course, with sparse matrices that are many things that are complicated, the matrix matrix multiply is not. So you get very high practical speed. So if you do this scheme, it will, even if the matrix is a modest size, again, say 5,000 by 5,000, this scheme would be much faster than doing column pivoted QR on the whole big matrix. Right. If the singular values of A decay very slowly, then you can end up with a slightly less than optimal selection of columns from this scheme. And the way to fix that is, as is always, always the case when we want to do low rank approximation on matrices that have slowly decaying singular values, is to do a couple of steps of power iteration. So I can replace, instead of extracting the sample like that, I can apply A a couple more times to the random matrix omega. And the key statement here is that you don't need to do 10 or 20 applications of A, that doing two, three, four applications is typically more than enough. Even in, even if you have you know, matrices with a ton of data, 5% noise or something like this, it still works really well with just a couple of steps of power iteration. And the effect here is of course to align the space spanned by the rows of F much more closely with the optimal subspace, which is the space spanned by the top K right singular vectors of A. This is also very well understood from a theoretical point of view. Um, but uh, let's talk about something that's maybe more of a novelty to many of us. So I, I don't know how well known these techniques are these days. Certainly when I studied numerical linear algebra, a long time ago. These things were not known at all, but it's, uh, yeah. So the fun thing to do here in uh, randomized linear algebra is to use what we call a structured random embedding. So we can take a matrix omega that has structure that allows us to evaluate this matrix matrix product much more rapidly. So something you can do is you can do a randomized Fourier transform, but you extract only a few of the Fourier coefficients. That turns out to be good if you do it in the right way. And this can be applied very rapidly. You can do this in complexity mn times log k instead of mn k. <clears throat> and uh, notice that this step has complexity something like, what is it, n k squared. So that's a lower order term. So now we've gone from complexity mn k overall for the column selection problem down to this guy. And you can actually do even more dramatic things. You can take an omega that consists almost entirely of zeros. As long as you make sure to pick at least two or three non-zero entries in each column of omega, you actually can prove that that oftentimes leads to perfectly decent solutions for low rank approximation of A, and then in consequence of that for solving the column selection problem. So you can actually in some sense get complexity O of mn. And I'm gonna show some numerical experiments to see how, how do these three options compare using Gaussian, using subsampled trigonometric transforms or using these sparse matrices. The one drawback or one drawback of these structured things is you cannot combine it with power iteration, right? So if the singular values decay very slowly, you might wanna to stick to Gaussian. Okay, so here is another fun fact. So this is a method proposed by Sorensen and Embry that performs very well. So this is um, an improvement to the basic scheme that I described. So what you can do, once you have the sample F, you can then, so the rows of F form an approximate basis for the row space of F. So what I can do is I can restrict A 
to that space spanned by the rows of A, and then computes the SVD of A, an approximation to the SVD of A in that space. And the output of that process is a set of K vectors that form approximations to the top K right singular vectors of A. And then we can apply this uh, dime technique where we basically pick the dominant modes by, by looking at the singular vectors. And in the language of numerical linear algebra, that's uh, partially pivoted LU decomposition, which is very fast. It's faster than column pivoted QR. It's much more communication efficient. And so we gain both speed actually, even though you do more work. So when I say it's counterintuitive, I mean, it sort of sounds like I'm introducing an enormous, or not I, Saracen and Embry, that they propose doing a lot of extra work compared to just doing column pivoted Q QR. But in practice, this is oftentimes slightly faster than the basic scheme and slightly more accurate as well. And then I am the kind of person who's always looking for a shortcut. So uh, together with uh, Yijun, my student, we've uh, been looking at sort of a very simplified version of DIME. So what if we skip doing the SVD and we just take this sample matrix F and then you perform, so F looks like this, and now just perform partial pivoted LU on, on the transpose of F, I suppose. So you pick the entry that has the largest magnitude in the first row of A, and then you proceed to the second and so on. So it's very fast. You, you basically just need to do a partially pivoted LU factorization of F transpose. So it's very, very fast. And uh, it turns out to perform basically as well as the other schemes. And this is inspired by work of Trefethen from 30 years ago that I actually was not aware of until quite recently, but it's, it's really interesting stuff. So, um, right. So, uh, yeah, let's skip that. Let's move on to numerical experiments. So the numerical experiments, I'm going to investigate two things. One is, um, so we'll first talk about what sort of random sketch should you construct. So we talked about Gaussians or the structured ones and how do they compare in terms of optimality and in terms of speed. So here are some numerical tests that uh, show how do these things perform in terms of optimality. So the blue line here are the singular values. Okay, so that's the best possible approximation you can get in doing a rank K approximation. And uh, so remember in this step, I'm not talking about this. I haven't gotten to column selection yet. The question is just how good of a basis are the rows of F for the ro row space of A? That's all, we are not doing column selection just yet. And uh, it turns out then that these trigonometric transforms, that's the yellow line, they perform basically as well as Gaussians. And this is gonna be a pattern in basically all examples we looked at. Here is the sparse transform. And it for the most part performs as well as the other two, but it sometimes trails a little bit. And we've run a lot of tests and the pattern we saw in the first one, it's always the same. The sparse one sometimes trails a little bit. The other two both perform very well. And here's another one. And so it's really interesting to me how well in particular the sparse one, because it feels like you're cheating. It feels like it, it's too cheap. It's, you, you cannot solve this problem in complexity MN, or that's how it felt to me, but it's in practice, it works very well. And if you look at computational speed, so now we're looking at the dense matrix, because that's really the only case where the trigonometric transforms have a chance to be competitive. And in this environment, when you have modest rank, trigonometric and Gaussian perform similarly. That's these two lines. And the sparse is always much faster. So this is the sparse, here's the sparse. So it's always very fast. If the rank is very large, if you want a low rank approximation where the rank is a thousand or something, then the trigonometric transform is starting to pull ahead. If the rank is more something like 50 or 100, then uh, the trigonometric and the Gaussian perform equally well. Okay, so next let's compare the different methods I described for post-processing 
your sketch. So you, we talked about zoom column pivot QR, we talked about this dime scheme and then the simplified dime scheme. So let's see how well they perform. So first we compare the computational speed. And here, for when the rank is modest, then whether you do column pivoted QR or you do the original dime scheme, they cost about the same. When the rank gets large, the dime scheme is actually a bit faster because it involves more communication efficient techniques. Column pivoted QR is really struggling once the matrices start to get large. But the, what I call the poor man's dime, where you do only partial pivoted LU on the sketch matrix F is much faster. In every case, it's much faster. And what happens in terms of accuracy? So these graphs, I'm starting to get a little bit tight on time. So let me go quickly and just tell you what the conclusions are here. Basically, in a nutshell, all these methods perform about equally well in terms of accuracy. The, uh, the ones that are larger here are techniques based on sampling, on leverage scores, which I haven't talked about. So let's skip those. The bottom line here in all these accuracy experiments is that all the techniques perform about equally well. If you look very closely, then dime is sometimes slightly, just a hair better in picking columns than the other ones. So, right. So here are the main lessons that I claim that we learned. So Gaussian matrices are always great. The sparse ones are amazing in the speed that they get. You do pay a little bit of a price in terms of accuracy, but it's really fascinating stuff that that works. And um, if you think I'm being overly lavishing praise on the sparse ones, it's, I, I had nothing to do with coming up with that. So it's, I'm at least not praising my own work. Um, all right, so Gaussian works very, very well. That's, that's my go-to one. I always use it myself, but the sparse ones are very tempting as well. Um, and then we compared three different techniques for doing the post-processing of the sketch matrix. And they all perform very equally, very comparably in terms of accuracy, but the last one is very, very fast. So it's sort of funny that there, there's been many years of people studying these methods. And as far as I can tell, really the simplest method is, is very hard to beat. And um, yeah, so keep it simple is the conclusion here. And uh, there's a manuscript. I'd really hoped that this would be up by now. So I could point you to the archive link and everything, but this manuscript is not quite done yet, but it's coming. So Yi Jun Dong is really excellent. She uh, did an undergrad where she was trained by James Nagy. So maybe that explains it. Um, right, so any questions on this part? So next I'm gonna switch to full factorizations, but I am happy to take a question or two. Uh, there's, there's one question of Cleve Moller. Mm -hmm. I have enabled his microphone. Maybe you can ask him, he can ask the question himself. Yeah, how about, how about availability of software? What do we want to do these things ourselves? Um, so, so everything I've described can be coded in MATLAB, for instance. Uh, and that's actually where we did most of the experiments. The only thing that, because you use very basic primitives, all you need here is you need to generate a Gaussian random matrix. You need to do matrix matrix multiply. You need to do partially pivoted LU or column pivoted QR. So all the functionality is in in software and it's really well implemented. So I mean, that's really the big selling point of these algorithms. You don't need to do complicated low level coding yourself to implement these techniques. The exceptions are, are the, the random sparse one sort of works using standard techniques. So you can implement that in MATLAB or some other package of your choice and that gives you reasonably good practical speed. The one thing that's really hard is are the subsampled trigonometric transforms. Uh, 
There are some software packages available for that. Uh, Mark Tiger had one some number of years ago, but it's getting a little bit dated and uh, it, it's really hard. Like that's, we struggle to get those graphs that this, I have not seen in the literature at careful timing comparison. And it's really because the subsample trig transforms are not, are not broadly available. There, there are some, but uh, I'm hoping this will have, that there would be more. And I, I think there's an, go ahead. So, so your software is not available. Is you, I'm looking for, I'm looking for packages I can download. I can send you a MATLAB script that has 10 lines in it that executes basically any of these algorithms except for, except for the fast trig transforms. That one is tricky. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's take one more quick question of, uh, of Cameron uh, Musco. So I'll unmute him. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, thanks. I had a question. Uh, have you tried like for this test matrix, just say like forming F by uniformly randomly sampling the rows and like, how does that work? Or if say like you random sample the rows uniformly in like a larger number of rows and then compress them with the Gaussian um, to speed things up. Does that totally fail or does it work okay? So uh, <laughs> short answer is that it totally fails. Okay. It's, it just doesn't work for these things. And even if you, there is another method that I didn't talk about, which is use the randomized SVD to form an approximation to the singular vectors, use those to form leverage scores and then sample according to leverage scores. That also, in our experience, fails completely for these examples. It's just not competitive with the other techniques. If you pick the top leverage scores instead of sampling, then it, it performs okay, but it, it's substantially less good than the other ones. But I didn't, I, I didn't include it in the talk because I'm, I'm perfectly aware that I may have misunderstood something or maybe I implemented something wrong. So I, I don't want to diss other methods until I'm yeah, really fine. sure. I'm not like offended. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I was just wondering yeah. like if, I guess what I was wondering is like, if you just, if you have a huge matrix and you, and you expect it to be reasonably well kind of spread out and you uniform sample, maybe not K plus P, but like 10 times K rows, and then sketch it, does it do decently in practice? I, and I've never really tried that, so I was just curious. Right, so I mean, so my take on sampling methods on leverage scores is that they are very, very valuable. So here's a slide that I skipped. So they're extremely valuable for cases, for situations where you cannot do other things. So in all the examples that I consider, the assumption is basically that the matrix vector multiply is affordable, that you can afford to apply the matrix to a hundred right. vectors or something. If you have a really enormous problem, or if you have very large, say kernel matrices where you just cannot do this. And in that case, you do need to do some kind of sampling. And that's where these methods, so I mean, it's in kernel rich regression, right? It's a huge success story of, uh, of leverage score sampling. You sort of do these things where you iteratively develop estimates of the leverage scores. So certainly those kinds of techniques where you have, um, you wanna do linear system solvers for these truly enormous linear systems where you cannot form the coefficient matrix and things like that. So in situations like that, sampling techniques are very powerful in that they provide a path towards solving things you otherwise couldn't do. But in a situation where you can afford to do the matrix vector multiply, we have not found them to be competitive. Cool, thanks, makes sense. Okay, so uh, we have a few more questions on, uh, on Zoom. If, so do you want to continue Gunnar with your talk? Yeah, you let me try to, I do wanna, cause this is, um, I am sort of yeah, go attached ahead. to this stuff. I, I'll try to keep it within six or seven minutes. I'll keep the non-essential stuff. You can go a bit longer because we already had a lot of questions, but okay. yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'll try to be efficient. So next part of the talk, I'll talk about techniques for computing full factorizations of matrices. And to start, I've grouped these in uh, some guys on the left that are not rank revealing, and then I have rank revealing factorizations on the right. And the critical difference between these is that 
these factorizations are quite easy to block. So you can implement them very efficiently on modern hardware. You can cast basically all flops as BLAST3 operations as opposed to BLAST2. But they certainly the two ones that I circled there, they are not rank revealing at all. And in contrast, the rank revealing ones tend to process the matrix as a sequence of rank one updates. And of course, there's been a lot of research on this. People have the story that I just told is very simplistic. There was a wonderful talk by Laura Grigori on exactly this subject, ways to do tournament pivoting and all sorts of ways of accelerating things. But nevertheless, it remains the case that if you want to compute a rank revealing factorization, the full factorization, that tends to be a much slower process than a non-rank revealing factorization. And despite all the progress, this is what happens if you, so this is actually run on MATLAB, just doing a full column pivot QR factorization versus a full QR factorization just from the command line, you know, not, nothing fancy. And there's almost an order of magnitude difference in speed between the two of them, even though the asymptotic flop count is identical. So it, it really is a big difference. So the objective of the last few minutes here is to see, can we implement these algorithms in a way so that the speed looks more like that? That's, that's really the objective. And um, yeah, let me, let, let me point people to the slides. So, so there's a wonderful history here about how, so getting, getting rid of pivoting, I'll just spend 15 seconds saying that this was actually explored in the 1990s, ideas of using randomized scrambling, these things that uh, Trefethen did looking at can you forego pivoting or certain random matrices and so on? That there was really interesting early work in this direction that the pivoting problem, it comes up in practice for sort of idiosyncratic reasons that a lot of the examples we're interested in behave in idiosyncratic ways that force you to do pivoting to get stability. Many naive numerical linear algebra algorithms work perfectly well on random data. You don't need pivoting. And this was explored, people, found out ways of doing fast random transforms and all this stuff. It, it has a, the, the field has a longer history than I had originally appreciated when uh, I started working here. And I just wanted to point that out. But uh, let's skip this stuff in the interest of time and go right to the heart of the matter. So the, the main result in the second part of the talk is a way of accelerating the column pivoted QR factorization. So let's consider a square matrix. So we're given a square matrix A and we want to find a pivoting matrix P, an orthonormal matrix U and an upper triangular matrix R. And of course, what we're looking for here in order to get an algorithm that implements, that runs efficiently on modern hardware, we want to do block updates to the matrix so that all the flops get cast in BLAST3 operations. So what we want to do is in the first step, we want to pick an initial batch of pivot columns, put those in the first slot. Then you do a local column pivot QR on, on this panel. That gives you a block update, a block householder reflector that you apply from the left. And then you repeat the process. So you now look at this guy, you pick another batch of B pivot columns, you put those here and then you repeat. So this is what you wanna do. And the trick here has been that it's very hard to find a set of good pivot columns because normally you would pick the first one and then you would update the rest of the matrix before you can pick the second one. So how do you find say 50 pivot vectors at once? And this is exactly what we spent our time talking about in the first 90% of the talk. This is exactly the column selection problem. So the solution now, if, if I manage to get the beginning of the talk reasonably comprehensible, then this slide will be very easy for you guys to follow because what we do is you take your big matrix A, 
you multiply it by a Gaussian matrix G like that, and then we get the sample matrix F. And now all you need to do is you pick your sample columns in F. So you can do classical column pivoted QR on F. And now the block size B is a tuning parameter that you can pick. So what you want to do here is that you want to pick it so that F fits in, in cache, basically close to the processor, because then column pivot QR is perfectly fast enough. It's, uh, it's a very efficient algorithm. And this is really how you resolve the blocking problem in this case. And here are some experiments that illustrate the computational speed that you get for these different methods. And the point is that when the matrices are small, then you don't get that much of a speed up. In this case, you can fit a lot of the matrix in fast memory close to the processor. So, you know, reducing memory movement doesn't gain you that much. But as the matrices get larger, and in particular, as you add more cores, the gains you get from this blocking technique really start to increase very dramatically. And we get certainly accelerations by a factor of five. And of course, the trend here is towards even larger acceleration as matrix sizes get larger. And in this case, this is a bit of work to implement. I certainly could not do it myself. This is joint work with coworkers who uh, did the heavy lifting in terms of implementation. This package is available on GitHub. And there's also related work by Dersh and Gu. And Julian Langu has been doing really nice work on similar ideas. So here, there, there certainly is code available. And these things perform very well. And the pivots that are selected by the randomized scheme are very comparable in quality from the deterministic scheme. And one thing, let me say one thing. So that there's one new twist that we didn't talk about in the first half of the talk. And it's basically what happens in cases where the singular values decay very slowly in the, in the block of the matrix that you're say in the, in the first step of this process, how well do you pick these columns? And there are two sort of two extreme environments. One is say the initial singular values decay very fast. Then you can show that the columns picked by this scheme and the columns picked by traditional pivoting are basically the same. Because in that case, the rows of F form an excellent basis for the row space of A. In the other extreme is when the singular values are very flat. In that case, there's basically no relationship between the pivots selected by this scheme and the pivots you would get from classical column pivoting. They can be completely different sets. But in that case, it doesn't matter because when the spectrum is entirely flat, any columns work. It, it really doesn't matter which pivots you pick. And then the sort of remarkable observation here is that these two situations sort of interpolate seamlessly, but you always get the best of both worlds there. And uh, yeah, I am out of time. Let's skip all this stuff. And uh, I will mention that on the slides, there are references. So you have access to the, to the slides on my website. There are some surveys, there are tutorials, and these are all linked to from my website. And here is uh, the software. But for the mo for the again, let me repeat that many of the algorithms from the first half of the talk or the first 90% of the talk, they are extremely simple to implement in basically any programming environments you have. You can call LAPAC routines out of the box and implement these things. You can program it in MATLAB. It's the they use very simple primitives, so they're easy to use. And I think I will take questions. Now I'll leave the slide or key points up. So thank you so much for, for this opportunity and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thanks Gunnar for this nice talk. Uh, I will try to be efficient with asking questions because it, there are many and it's a bit of a chaos in my chat. Uh, uh, just let me mention that uh, Jim Demmel uh, made a remark that 
they're working on a uh, on randomized techniques in LAPEC and in uh, SCALAPEC. So he might have to say more about it uh, at the end of the talk, but uh, I just wanted to give the remark already. Um, and then Mark van Barel asked uh, if it's possible to extend these things to tensor decompositions. Um, so there's certainly been a lot of work and for low dimensional tensors, if you have dimension three, say, then you, you can extend it in, the, in a simplistic way. You sort of untensorize, so you compress one dimension at a time and you untensorize the other two dimensions and you compress there. So you sort of build a basis for one direction at a time. You typically in these algorithms have to iterate because it's, you know, with tensors, the decompositions are not unique. It's sort of more of an optimization problem than it is a classical linear algebra problem. Then as the tensor dimensions get higher, you have to do more, more aggressive sampling techniques. You just cannot afford to do these dense things that look at everything. So everything that I talked about basically looks at every single matrix entry. So if you have a high dimensional tensor, th this is really completely undoable. And this is actually another example where um, the, uh, the sampling techniques that uh, we got a question about earlier come in very handy. And I, I believe Tammy Calder has done some very interesting work in this direction for how do you sample sort of the large part of the tensor that you want to compress. And these things have been very, very effective, very powerful. Okay, um, Alex, you had a question. Uh, hi, hi, Gunnar. Thank you for the very nice talk. So I wondered uh, how important in your mind was a Max Vol like criteria. If let's say I'm doing a CUR factorization, I'm picking a K by K sub matrix with a pivoting strategy that doesn't get something that's Max Vol like. Uh, do you think is there a worse? Is there a matrix for which that pivoting strategy doesn't deliver a near best approximation? Then, so I'm thinking, is Max Vol necessary and sufficient? It's max, I just can't it's, pick up It's the... maximum volume pivoting, ah, uh -huh. necessary and sufficient for a near best. Um, so so th th this, this question is really strikes at the heart of the matter. So, so, so just to repeat, so um, I'm sort of sorting things through in my mind. So, so we know that maximum volume is in some sense optimal, but finding the absolute maximum volume is known to be NP hard. So we, we can't do that. So we always look for some sort of relaxation of that. And the techniques that I've described, it, it's a very sort of conceptual relaxation that we have results like the likelihood of sampling some K tuple of, um, of vectors, it's in some sense proportional to their spanning volume. So we are sort of optimizing on the right quantity in a sense. Um, and then are you asking? But then there's like Kahan counter examples that say, if you do column like QR, column pivoted or Gauss elimination, complete pivoting. Yeah, so, so my sense is that the reason a lot of this stuff works is that the counter examples are very fragile. So if you take the Kahan counter example and you code it, for instance, oftentimes it works really nice because round of errors mess things up. You have to really disable pivoting. That if you run standard software on the Kahan counter example, sometimes it works because you know, it accidentally picks the right pivots. So the problem is very forgiving in my, my experience has been that in order to break these things, you really have to find these very very particular counterexamples. I guess I'm thinking, do you think there's a polynomial time pivoting strategy that is provably gets near best? Or do you think you have to go to an MP? Oh, uh, Gu and Eichenstadt did that, right, in 96. So they, they have a strategy. It, it's a greedy algorithm, but it, so it's similar to traditional column pivoting, but they look at slightly more sophisticated quantities. So you look at sort of proxies for the subdeterminants that you try to maximize. And their algorithm does have worst case runtime of cube, 
Um, yeah, so in principle, you want m and k, but it can behave more like m n squared if m is larger than n. But in practice, it does behave more like m and k typically. And that one is provably rank revealing in the sense that the suboptimality factor does not grow exponentially like the known counterexamples. Okay. It grows only polynomially. Thank you. So th that can be done deterministically. Thank you. Okay, so I think in the interest of time and keeping the format similar to all the rest, I propose we stop here. But uh, after the farewell of Melina, we will leave the Zoom open and then uh, people can continue discussing and asking questions. If, and if Gunnar still have time, his has time, then he can also answer. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll uh, thank you, first of all, uh, Gunnar, for the nice talk. Um, and hopefully you can see my uh, slide. Uh, for the next seminar. So uh, thank you all for attending and uh, thank you for the nice talk. I've just put up, uh, can you actually see this? Uh, yeah, um, the, the slide for the next uh, few talks, uh, which, which you can see here. We're going up right to the SIAM Linear Algebra Conference, which is our the, the SIAM uh, signature meeting. Um, since we are endorsed by SIAM, we should be careful that we don't interfere with them. Um, and, uh, and then we take a break. And uh, as last time, we keep this meeting open so we can actually uh, continue uh, answering uh, some of the questions and you can have a, a chit chat if you'd like to. And uh, this, won't be, uh, trans uh, this won't be recorded from now on or transmitted to YouTube. Thank you.